Ancient Egypt was one of the most powerful empires of the ancient world, and at various times throughout its existence, it was the most powerful and wealthiest, and certainly one of the most influential empires of the ancient Mediterranean that we will be studying. But what also makes Egypt remarkable is its consistent and stable culture. Uh, Egyptian culture changed very little uh, over a 3,000 year period. I mean, there are changes, of course, uh, but when you look at the overall sp scope and, and span of Egyptian culture, it's remarkable how little it changed. Um, Let's take a look here. This is a series of images over the span of uh, Egyptian, uh, Egyptian history. And if we look at images that dating back from the very beginning of the culture, around 3000 BC or so, all the way up to 660 BC, so you know, all, over 2600, almost 2700 years of time we're looking at, the art changed very, very little. It's, unless you're sort of an expert Egyptologist, it's difficult to um, discern, you know, an object made later in the New Kingdom with an object made from the Old Kingdom, with an object made from uh, the early pre-dynastic period. If we compare this to, say, Italian culture, neighboring Italian culture, uh, Italy's not too far from Egypt, and here we're only looking at uh, like two-thirds of the same length of time. This is from the first century of the Common Era until the early 20th century. So we're looking at 2,000 years as opposed to 3,000 years of history. And look at the remarkable changes we see from the, the very left, the Roman Imperial period, uh, all the way through sort of Byzantine Christian period, through sort of later Catholic uh, Christian eras, up through the Renaissance into uh, the neoclassical period, and all the way up to the, our modern age. Uh, the changes are remarkable and significant. Uh, but when you look at Egyptian art, it is astonishingly consistent. And so the question is, is why? Um, why did Egyptian art not change significantly in this long period of time? And, and w one of the answers is because of its geography. Uh, Egypt is, is uh, an empire that was constructed along the Nile River, the longest river in the world. And, you know, we have seen, of course, other cultures like Mesopotamia, of course, built along the Nile. But unlike the sort of wild and erratic nature of the Tigris and Euphrates River, uh, the Nile is very consistent, and, and this provided Egypt their, uh, their sustenance. This provided Egypt uh, with their ability to grow food and to build an empire, because the Nile floods very regularly. And when it floods, it leaves this sort of blanket of silt on the either side of the banks of the Nile. But it's only a narrow strip. It's only like three or five miles wide. So the rest of the area around Egypt is desert. So in many ways, Egypt is sort of an island culture. It's an insular culture uh, protected by this vast expanse of desert. The only way to really invade Egypt is to go through, to go down the Nile. Now, Egypt was invaded over its time, uh, but much, much less than other cultures were. And this meant Egypt was more of a monoculture with one sustained belief, one sort of sustained people over a long period of time. Um, but also this, uh, so this meant that things changed, uh, were able to remain more consistent over this long period of time. But something else that helps is the Egyptian belief system, which was rooted very much in, in the Nile River itself. The Nile is not only sort of the, the heart of Egypt sort of geographically, but it's the heart of Egypt sort of intellectually and spiritually. The annual flooding of the Nile was very, very regular and very, very consistent. And if things ever got out of whack, this would, the, the difference between life and death to the Egyptians, uh, if the Nile didn't flood sort of regularly every year, well then you wouldn't have the silt and the rich farmland to grow crops and the nation would crumble. And so they kind of built their religious beliefs based on this sort of consistent regularity uh, of this annual flooding of the Nile. And the Egyptian belief system was rooted heavily in that, um, based on these cycles. But also, uh, you know, Egyptians believe that if, if you change things too much, this would sort of lead to chaos. 
Uh, Egypt was a funerary culture, just like the Sumerians uh, were, and a lot of ancient cultures were, but they took this to a much larger degree than other cultures did. Uh, Egyptians believed, like the Sumerians and other Mesopotamian cultures, that you had to prepare for the afterlife. Um, but if you didn't prepare absolutely correctly, if, if the right which rituals weren't performed, if the right artifacts and objects weren't buried with you, then this could be disastrous. So for example, if you weren't buried with food to take along with you, then you would starve in the afterlife. You wouldn't have anything to eat. Um, or if you didn't have pictures of things you wanted to do painted on the inside of your tomb, um, for example, hunting, then you couldn't hunt in the afterlife. Um, so it was very important that sort of all the T's were crossed and all the I's were dotted in Egyptian culture, because if these rituals weren't carried out to the T, then this could be disastrous. Uh, so this led to a culture that embraced this sort of ultra unchanging, ultra-conservative, if you will, uh, belief in tradition over everything else. And it led to a culture that, that whose art did not change significantly over 3,000 years. We divide Egyptian culture into several large periods we call dynasties. Uh, dynasties are basically ruling families. And this comes from a um, third century Greek historian, a guy named, or Egyptian historian. Uh, he was Greek because he was part of a dynasty, late dynasty that ruled Egypt that were basically Greeks. Um, but his name was Manetho, and um, he sort of laid out these distinct eras, the pre-dynastic era, and then the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom. And these are basically based on the families that ruled Egypt. Uh, in between these uh, periods, we have what we call intermediate periods that, not, that we're not really going to discuss, where Egypt either sort of fell into civil war or it, it was occupied by outside forces. So this did happen. It wasn't just a super regular thing. Um, these dates might change depending on the book that you're reading, because even though this concept of sort of the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom has been consistent for over 2,000 years, as historians discover new evidence, sometimes the dates can shift slightly. So if you're reading a slightly older edition of your textbook, or you're looking online, and the dates for the New Kingdom here don't match up with what you're reading, it's not a big deal. They can shift by, you know, a few decades here and there. The sort of best way to think about it is the Old Kingdom is the time of the Great Pyramids, uh, and the New Kingdom is the time of sort of large-scale uh, temples. Uh, so there were some changes in Egyptian architecture, significant changes in Egyptian architecture over time, uh, but in general the culture was remarkably consistent. What you are looking at is one of the oldest and first examples of Egyptian art. This comes from what we call the pre-dynastic period, so before the establishment of the continuing families of, of pharaohs that ruled Egypt for the next almost 3,000 years. Um, we are looking at the very dawn of that era of rule. This is a reconstruction, a watercolor reconstruction of a tomb painting from a tomb of an early Egyptian leader. And what you are looking at um, is something that should be, appear familiar to you. Um, the, this looks very similar to Sumerian art. In fact, this is contemporary to a lot of the Sumerian art that you have already seen. If you remember the Warka vase, which is around 3200 or so BCE, so this is contemporary uh, with that object. And if you look closely, you can see there are some very similar strategies uh, to, the, to Sumerian art. Um, look down here at sort of the uh, lower left, or sort of center lower left and you will see there is that heraldic figure. We have a figure holding two strong animals. In this case, it looks like bulls at bay.
Um, if you look around here, uh, what we are looking at is an image of battle. We're not exactly sure what this is, if this is a real battle, if this is a mythological battle. Uh, this might have been between these pre-dynastic Egyptian people and people from uh, the Mesopotamian era. Uh, we don't know. We also might be looking at a burial, at uh, some funerary barges taking the body to its final uh, resting place. Funerary is, once again, re uh, relates to funerals or a uh, religious uh, culture centered on death. <laughs> um, and in many ways the style, these uh, sort of very simple geometric shapes used for the figures, the triangular shaped bodies, the large eye on the side of the head in this sort of composite figure is something that should look very familiar to you and we have seen since, you know, the, the ancient Sumerians and this is contemporary with that. So what this is telling us that there was a lot of um, interaction between the Mesopotamian cultures and Egyptian culture. Our next image will look a lot more Egyptian to you. Um, one of the reasons for this is the use of registers. We often associate uh, this, these sort of strict structured imagery with ancient Egypt and that is something uh, we are certainly uh, seeing here. These registers, these bands, remember, are used to help tell the story in much the same way that a modern comic book tells a story. You are looking at a fascinating image, an image, once again, that sort of blurs the line between myth and history. We're not exactly sure if this commemorates 100% real events or this is more sort of a, a myth, uh, but you are looking at sort of a foundational event in Egyptian history, the creation, the unification of Egypt by a guy named Narmer, who is considered to be the first pharaoh, a man who brings together uh, the areas of Upper and Lower Egypt. So let's take a little bit uh, closer look. So this is a palette. A palette um, is uh, a device you use to mix pigments on. Painters use palettes. This is a makeup palette. Uh, although it was probably never used as an actual makeup palette to mix makeup, uh, but was instead used as um, a ceremonial object. Um, Egyptians wore eye makeup as part of their sort of religious faith and also as a sign of their, their various ruling classes would wear uh, uh, eye makeup. Uh, this probably originated from a very practical um, use of, of makeup to reduce uh, the glare from the, the, the heat and light of the desert in much the same way that a ball player would, will put a grease on their cheekbones. Uh, this probably evolved from that. So what we are looking at here is Narmer, this pharaoh. You can see him in the center of this, of the palette here, on the back of the palette. <coughs> Narmer is uh, being associ uh, associated with the god Horus, who is associated um, with the living god of the pharaoh. Uh, remember, the pharaoh is seen as a god, or at least sort of a demigod, uh, on earth. When he dies, uh, then he becomes sort of a full god. But right now, he is associated with Horus, the sort of protector god of the pharaoh on earth. And if you look closely, you can see in the pharaoh's hand is a scepter. Uh, in his other hand, he is holding the uh, body of, of his enemy, and he is about to hit this guy in the head. So what we are looking at is a military victory. This unification, uh, whether it, we're looking at a sort of a mythological or a historical account of it, it was a unification through violence, or at least it was depicted here as a unification through violence. We can see Narmer is wearing the crown of Upper Egypt, this sort of bowling pin. And then above him we have an image of the goddess Hathor, who is also associated with pharaohs. Uh, mythologically, her milk provides sustenance for the pharaohs. And then we see, um, once again, Horus, this falcon god, this 
pharaoh, protector of the pharaoh, holding um, this figure, this odd sort of hybrid of man and plant, uh, representing Lower Egypt. Lower Egypt is associated with the papyrus plant, and so we see this sort of papyrus bush man hybrid under the um, being held by Horus. So once again, as another symbol of victory of Narmer over his enemy, the people of Lower Egypt. At the very bottom, we see in more images of people being conquered. These are fully nude. We've talked about this before. Naked equals shame in a lot of ancient uh, Mesopotamian and Egyptian and Mediterranean art, not always, but in a lot of cases, and especially in images of war or battle. Let's take a look uh, at the other side. Uh, you'll see at the top, in fact, this is at the top of both palettes, is a symbol of Narmer. Uh, so we know that this is, uh, that this is uh, meant to commemorate his victory. Uh, this is the first labeled work of art. This is the first work of art that we know what it's about ex explicitly because it tells us <laughs> who it's for. Uh, if we look below that top register, we can see the uh, another register of a battlefield, a register depicting a battlefield. We see Narmer using hieratic scale, so he is bigger than everybody else because he's most important. He's wearing the crown of Lower Egypt, so uh, on the other side we saw him with the crown of Upper Egypt, so this is meant to show his rule over both um, both kingdoms now. We see these smaller uh, standard bearers. No, they're not hobbits. Uh, they're not monumentally short. <laughs> they're just not as important as the pharaoh, so they are shown as being small. And then we see, once again, the idea that this is a violent victory. Um, and if you look over here to the left, I've blown it up, you can see uh, the, the people of um, Lower Egypt been decapitated, his enemies have been vanquished, and their heads have been placed between their legs. So um, this is once again a symbol of his victory. Below that we see these two hybrid creatures that are made up of, of lions and serpents being held together by these servants of Narmer. Once again, um, the, the two beasts are meant to symbolize Upper and Lower Egypt being tamed, being controlled, and being unified in sort of this circle of, of unity. Uh, but also, this circle is where the makeup would have been mixed had this actually been used for makeup. At the very very bottom, we see another image of a bull, a powerful animal, uh, trampling over its naked, vanquished enemy. You know, this is an ancient symbol once again. Uh, we have seen bulls all the way back to pa uh, uh, Paleolithic times. We have seen them all over ancient Sumer, uh, other cultures in ancient Mesopotamia as a symbol of power, of male power, of virility, of strength, of... Um, you know, a power animal. So with these images of the gods, this should be familiar to you because um, what is happening is that the presence of Horus, the presence of Hathor, are sort of justifying uh, Narmer's victory. Um, it is one thing for a king to rule over somebody else or to conquer them in battle because they want to, uh, but it is another thing if the, if the gods have either demanded it or approved of it. Uh, they have sanctified it. And so this is what these gods, uh, Horus and Hathor, are doing here. They are approving of Narmer's victory. In fact, they have probably commanded uh, Narmer's victory. So this is a divine victory as, de as declared and approved for by the gods. The Egyptian religion was focused on death. Death was a vital part of the Egyptian belief system. Um, the Egyptian belief was, as we discussed, was sort of cyclical. It was this sort of concept of a, a constant kind of rebirth. Not necessarily reincarnation, but sort of a, a movement into another realm, another life after this one. And so, 
the, the life in the afterlife was not that dissimilar to the one here. Um, you needed a place to live, you needed food, you needed things to do. And so the Egyptians buried their dead with grave goods. Uh, for the elite classes, these could be very, very elaborate. Um, we will see pharaohs buried with you know, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of objects made of precious materials. Um, but all of these were meant to sort of serve a practical purpose. You know, chairs to sit on, games to play, weapons to hunt with in the afterlife. These all had to be provided. The earliest Egyptian tombs in the pre-dynastic period were called mastabas. Um, they were these sort of low-lying trapezoidal shaped buildings like we see here with the tombs underneath. So these are basically houses for the dead. The first pyramid is basically a series of mastabas stacked on top of each other. These were made for a pharaoh named Djoser and built by a guy named Imhotep. Imhotep was highly regarded during pre-dynastic Egypt. He was the high priest, high priest for Djoser. Um, when he died, uh, Imhotep was elevated to a, a son of a god's status. So this is a guy who had a, a lot of power and a lot of prestige and was brilliant. Um, he was this brilliant architect. In fact, he's arguably the first architect whose name we actually know. Um, so, you know, this is a guy of tremendous influence, and uh, he created, by all accounts, the first pyramid. Now, it's not what we would associate with the Great Pyramids of Giza. Uh, this is a step pyramid, so it's basically a series of five mastabas st stacked on top of each other. Uh, you can see, um, you know, you can, if you look down the side, you can see it's not smooth. Uh, this would have been uh, covered, though, however, with limestone, uh, just like the Great Pyramids of Giza were, giving it this sort of white appearance. This is a sacred mountain. This is a holy mountain. Uh, we've seen this before in um, uh, Mesopotamia in Sumer with the ziggurat, although the functions here are different. The ziggurat is a, an artificial mountain made out of mud brick with a stone temple on top. The... Um, the step pyramid of Yozer is entirely made of stone, so this is the first fully stone structure in the history of the world. So this was all made of stone, and it is not a temple, it is a house for the dead. And it is not a singular object, but it is part of a much larger mortuary complex that was used for a 30-year ritual, or ceremony, I should say, uh, commemorating the pharaoh. And so it is filled with dozens of buildings. Uh, many of these buildings are actually dummy buildings. They're, there's nothing going on inside. In fact, they're generally filled with rubble. So these are almost like movie sets. Um, so these aren't buildings that were necessarily be, be meant to be used by uh, the living, but were, once again, made for the dead. There are buildings that can be entered here. There are temples for the pharaoh. Because the pharaoh, in the after his death, was worshipped as a god, so there would have been pharaohs, or there would have been temples located near the pyramids, and there are located near the pyramids as as places for worship of the pharaoh by the priest. Uh, the entire complex is surrounded by a large limestone wall, um, something like 5,400 feet. Uh, around 34 feet tall. So this is a massive structure meant to separate it from the its environment. This is a sacred spot. This is a sacred space. Uh, there are 14 um, doors, 13 of them being artificial, placed around uh, the walls only. There's only one true entrance uh, into this structure. The facades of the building are decorated with columns. On the left, we see uh, columns with capitals resembling papyrus plants. These are symbols of Lower Egypt, as we've already talked about. And on the right, we see fluted uh, columns. These are meant to resemble reeds. Egyptian columns were based on plant forms, so you were, we're going to see papyruses, we're going to see lotus flowers, we're going to see reeds, we're going to see lots of, lots of sort of vegetal plants. Um, 
kinds of decoration. Um, these these columns are called fluted, though. These sort of grooves along here uh, are called flutes, and this is something that we will see also in ancient Greece and many places in the ancient Mediterranean world. When most people think of ancient Egypt, of course, they think of the pyramids. So the pyramids, of which there are three, what we call the Great Pyramids, are located in a necropolis called Giza, which is on the west side of the Nile. Um, most necropoloi, most uh, necropolises, uh, were going, are going to be located on this side. Why? Because of the symbolism of the rising and the setting sun, the sun sets, of course, in the west. And these um, necropolises are cities of the dead, and they contain large burial structures. In this case, the three most famous and largest burial structures in the world, uh, the Great Pyramids of the Pharaohs Menkare, Khafre, and Khufu. These are massive structure varying in size from around 400 to 500 feet uh, tall. These are absolutely massive, made with tens of thousands of cut, of cut stone. Uh, the, let's take a look inside uh, the Pyramid of Khufu. Uh, this is in many ways uh, kind of typical of all of the the Great Pyramids. Uh, it is mostly solid on the inside. These are structures that weren't made for um, you know, sort of large crowds, but were really made for one person, uh, the pharaoh. The, um, the pyramid is based on a shape called the Ben-Ben, B-E-N-B-E-N. -E -E this comes from the um, basic uh, Egyptian mythology, the creation myth, which said that there, in the uh, beginning there was this sort of primordial chaotic waters and emerging out of that was this sort of mud mountain. And on that mountain, once again, holy mountain, we can't get away from it, uh, on that mud mountain was the god Amun, who later on is going to be associated with the god Re or Ra, the sun god who is closely associated with the pharaohs. So this Ben Ben is, you know, it's an artificial mountain. The pyramids are artificial mountains. They're holy mountains. They, I have been, I have heard them dis, uh, been described as ascension machines, and and certainly, you know, their their shape is meant to sort of imply an upward motion. The mountain implies high places, holy places, divinity, uh, and this is a, a way for the Pharaoh's soul to ascend up into the heavens. The structures themselves um, are, uh, the interior structures are rather small. As you can see, number five here is the king's chamber. Above it is a series of floating stones with a uh, pyramidal shaped stone. These are relieving stones. Um, these are meant to help spread the weight coming down from uh, above from the weight of the point of the pyramid and push it outwards and downwards and then these other stones act as a kind of a cushion uh, to uh, help keep the central chamber intact. There are other chambers here where some burial objects would be would have been placed, pardon me, but the uh, you'll notice at the very bottom is a false tomb chamber and this was to help deter thieves, um, but it didn't work. These pyramids, like all of the Great Pyramids, were robbed. As impressive as they are, they are also big billboards for robbers. Uh, even though they were guarded, it was not, um, it didn't take long for them to be robbed of their luxurious grave goods. These are massive structures. Uh, as I said, you know, between 400 and 500 feet tall. Um, you can sort of look at the numbers there at the bottom, but you know, the, the, you would build one of these, it would require tens of thousands of people, but in the same way you would construct any sort of large structure, you would level the site, you would uh, then have to quarry millions of limestone blocks, and the tools that were used by the ancient Egyptians were rather uh, simple tools. We're talking about stone and copper chisels, wooden mallets, 
and then these would then need to be transported with the use of human and animal labor on carts and sleds to the site. Um, then there the masons cut and dressed the blocks. This is known as ashlar masonry with very precise carefully cut blocks. And then you move these blocks in, into place using ramps made out of rubble. And then at the end, a layer of white limestone was added. So to sort of symbolize the sort of rays of the sun god, uh, Ray or Ra, however you want to pronounce it, both are acceptable, um, this limestone would have been added to um, give this sort of divine and holy look to the pyramid. So the pyramids that we see today have been stripped of their outer layer of limestone and are, uh, while still very impressive, not nearly as impressive as they would have been. Uh, the, um, the amount of labor it took to construct these was uh, significant, something like 25,000 workers, uh, not slaves. Um, we can blame the Greek historian Herodotus, who um, probably uh, said that these were built mostly with slave labors to uh, make the Greeks look better and to make it appear as if uh, you know, the Egyptians had to rely on outside labor beside their own to construct these. Um, but no, we know that, that um, the, the men who built these uh, were either paid um, skilled um, masons or they were um, did this as a part of sort of holy service as a kind of a taxation uh, to the state in the same way that you know in, in, in some cultures you know military service is mandatory something like that would have been going on here but we know that these people were treated relatively well and um, there are uh, several small villages that were set up to house the tens of thousands of people uh, who built these. And it wasn't just a man, it was, there were women, like half the bodies that were found in uh, the burial grounds near here were those of women, and uh, good, of almost a quarter of these were children and babies. So uh, the, these were, you know, family unions, uh, units living and working here. And uh, um, because, you know, you have to think that you're not just uh, paying for labor to construct these structures, but you have to have an entire support system. You have to have people to cook food. You have to have people to build the the lodgings for the people building these things. You would have to have um, roads, machines, everything built to construct these. So uh, you're looking at uh, you know a small city uh, that had to be uh, uh, created to design these and, and, and build these and realize these massive structures. Uh, so it's just a huge amount of labor. And what's really remarkable is it took only 70 years to construct all three of these pyramids. They, uh, the, the construction of these began at the, um, well, when the pharaoh was born, and it, they, it ended when the pharaoh died. But throughout the entire uh, the pharaoh's life, these were being worked on and they were being built. And uh, despite their enormous size, they were constructed relatively quickly. And it's uh, these three pyramids um, don't exist in isolation, but are a uh, part of a much larger uh, complex. Uh, all three pyramids. Uh, to one degree or another have related temples, what we call mortuary temples, where the statue of the pharaoh would have been placed um, uh, after the pharaoh's death and served as a place for reverence where priests would have actively occupied the temples and prayed to the god kings. Uh, so these weren't just sort of abandoned and let to uh, you know, sit there looking all pretty and imposing, but were structures that were in continuous use for hundreds if not thousands of years after their uh, uh, after their completion but you can see uh, um, the uh, uh, you know, some of the other some of the temples especially by the time we get to Khufu uh, his the the temple is quite large uh, the temple complex is quite large with dozens and dozens of buildings Probably the most famous related structure outside of the pyramids, though, is uh, related to Khafre's, the Pharaoh Khafre's pyramid, and that is uh, with the Sphinx. Um, the Sphinx is a large statue, about 65 feet or so tall, 
and about 240 feet long. Uh, that is carved and that is hewn from um, a, a, a stone that was uh, not moved here, but is, occurs naturally. There are debates and arguments that this uh, was originally the image com of a complete lion, and then after Khafre's death, the head was changed and carved down to be that of of Khafre. Pardon me, guys. Um, you know, the this is nothing um, th that should be remarkable to you at this point, and because we have seen this kind of visual strategy where a king is. Uh, his body is hybridized with that of a powerful animal. We've seen this all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia, and especially with the Assyrians and the Lamassus, with the head of the king and the body of the bull and the wings of the eagle. So this is all, um, these are all pretty old strategies at this time. Although this would have, this would have been concurrent or so with um, some of the earlier Mesopotamian um, civilizations. Um, but whether this changed in appearance dramatically or not, the idea is that this is an image of power. Um, the fact that it's carved from a stone meant that the, the stone originally was probably seen as a kind of a sacred object, and then it was turned into a, even a more revered object by carving it in the likeness of a powerful animal and um, a king. And the sphinxes exist throughout Egyptian history, even much later, a thousand years later, at the temple of a pharaoh named Hatshepsut, we see um, a sphinx bearing that pharaoh's likeness, which we'll talk about more, uh, well, very shortly. Sculpture is found all over ancient Egypt. It is found in temples, it is found in tombs, it is found in palaces. Uh, it was used as images uh, to portray images of the gods. It was used um, to commemorate the dead, uh, as is the case with this particular uh, sculpture. This is a sculpture of the pharaoh Khafre um, sitting on a throne. Uh, so first of all, let's just talk about the material. A material. This is made from a material called diorite, which is an incredibly strong material. It had to be imported from Mesopotamia. It is not local to Egypt. So once again, we see the use of materials here um, to denote wealth and power. Uh, this is not a kind of material that would have been available to everybody and would not have certainly been used in making artifacts related to common people. Um, and then we also see uh, the beyond the material, the way this image is sculpted. It is about life size. Uh, this would have been placed within Khafre's temple. Um, the Egyptian gods were viewed, or the Egyptian pharaohs were viewed as gods. And especially after their ascent into the, the afterlife, um, they were worshipped as gods. And in some of these more powerful pharaohs or some of the more popular pharaohs, uh, there was continued veneration for thousands of years. Their temples were open and active for thousands of years. They were l literally um, man gods. Uh, so we see Khafre here sitting enthroned both as pharaoh or king and as a god. Uh, behind him on his head, you will see the god um, Horus. Uh, once again, this god associated with the, the pharaohs, the, um, the, living, the living Horus we have here, um, the pharaoh himself. And we have the protector god, uh, kind of shielding with his wings. He literally has the Pharaoh's back shielding him as a protector god. Um, we have seen Horus already related to Pharaoh when we looked at the uh, palette of, of Narmer. Um, the, you'll notice that the sculpture is very tight. There is no negative space. There are no empty spaces. Uh, there's you know, a practical purpose for this, it would have been easier to carve and it would have um, wasted less material. However, the primary reason is to protect the integrity of the sculpture because this sculpture held something called the Ka. The Ka is the soul of the pharaoh. 
the Egyptian concept of the soul is incredibly complex. Uh, there are five major aspects of the soul. There's the name, the heart, there's the ka itself, which is sort of the our kind of contemporary concept of what a soul is, sort of a reflection of yourself. There's the ba, which is your personality, and then there's the shut, which is your shadow. Uh, these all have sort of different functions and had to be um, considered and prepared for in different ways during the the whole burial process. But for our purposes, it's the Ka that we're focusing on, because this is sort of the soul of the Pharaoh, and this is um, what needed to be protected, because the soul without this statue would have been lost on its journey into the afterlife. This statue gives it a base to sort of return to, and this statue would have been treated as if it were a living person. The priest of the Pharaoh's temple would have bathed it, they would have offered it food, uh, they would have treated it like the Pharaoh himself. If we uh, look at the, uh, the, the Pharaoh's portrait, uh, we can see that he is wearing his ceremonial beard, uh, which is a symbol of his power. This was related to the god Osiris, who he will be reunited with in the afterlife. On the side of the um, throne, we see image, an image of the papyrus and the lotus, once again symbols of upper and, low, and lower Egypt, associated with the pa uh, pharaoh's rule of all of Egypt. But what I want you to really pay attention to is how the pharaoh is depicted. He is flawless, he is perfect, he is young, he is eternal. Khafre, when this was created, was an old man. He certainly wasn't youthful and strong, but here he is shown as muscular. Um, it was important um, to show the pharaoh as perfect, because first of all, he's godlike, but also this is his body for eternity. In fact, in, in general, Egyptian sculpture tends to show, um, to depict its subject matter as kind of eternal, uh, especially in the lack of emotion. These are funerary objects. These are objects of great reverence. These are objects that are meant to facilitate your journey into the afterlife. So, you know, showing an accurate portrait of somebody, showing somebody portraying re realistic emotions were not important to the sculptors here. Uh, what was important was to sort of, sort, of, sort of preserve the integrity of the pharaoh. In fact, sculptor itself means he who keeps alive. So the job here isn't to represent the pharaoh, but it is to house <laughs> the soul of the pharaoh, the ka of the pharaoh. Um, these sculptures had very sort of strict rules and regulations. In fact, in general, Egyptian art had very strict rules and regulations. We've already talked about how uh, Egyptians were sort of obsessed with this idea of, of permanence. And you can see that by the fact that their art and architecture changed relatively um, hardly at all. Um, you know, throughout this almost 3,000 year period of Egyptian rule. And one way they did this was by using a grid. Now this grid could kind of change over time slightly, but for the most part this grid was, was based on a series of 18 vertical squares. And the aver and Egyptians were shown to be based on, on this proportion. Um, each square was the size of the hand. So, you know, no matter kind of what period we're in or where this sculpture or painting is, they're always going to follow the strict rule of proportions because the Egyptians wanted this kind of permanence. They wanted this sort of unchanging kind of quality. Because, you know, at the heart of it, the Egyptians believed that if, if things changed, if things were altered, uh, then that could, you could have dire consequences. The world could fall apart. So it was very important to maintain this consistency. And we have proof of this. We have images of Egyptian artists working. And in this case, we see um, a group of, of sculptors creating a statue. They would have started with a block of diorite, which they would have drawn a grid on the side of. 
and then they would have put a picture basically on all four sides, front, sides, and back. Uh, of the various views of the pharaoh. And then they would have sculpted from the outside in. And that's also one reason why these sculptures have this very sort of blocky appearance, because they're really made by just reducing this large block and sort of carving bits and pieces away until you kind of zoom in into the middle. So we are looking at two pairs of um, sculpture of, of couples. On the left we have an image of Rahutep and Nofret uh, from their mastaba at a place called Maidam in Egypt. Um, this is painted limestone. Egyptians did paint especially limestone. You don't often see that with um, some of the darker stones like diorite and the material on the right which is called gray whack, um, because it doesn't hold the pigment as well. But with limestone and other kinds of porous materials that could absorb the paint, you, you certainly will see painted sculpture. Um, we have th uh, what we saw in the Khafre statue. We have this sort of thousand-yard stare, this kind of blank, unemotional uh, feeling of sort of this eternal permanence in the faces of the pharaoh. We see um, their hands over their heart. Um, the heart was um, central to Eg the Egyptian belief of the soul. That is where it resided, and that is it was preserved in the body, in the mummy. So we see this hand over the heart sort of symboling the importance, uh, symbolizing the importance of that. Uh, um, let's look at the image on the right, though. Um, we see another royal portrait. We see uh, Mankare, who is uh, Khafre's son, and his wife. And uh, we see them in this very sort of rigid pose, which is typical of Egyptian uh, sculpture. We see uh, that sort of perfect youthful body and that perfect youthful face on both of the subjects here. And then we see this sort of typical Egyptian left foot forward. This is something that is depicted throughout ancient Egypt. Um, and it's, it's, it's really not understood completely why. It, it might have to do with the fact that the heart is on the left side and the heart is sort of the center of the soul. But otherwise, we don't really know. It's just this convention that was used throughout the history of ancient Egypt, and we see it over and over again. But it certainly gives this idea of this for feeling of motion, this feeling of walking. Um, although it is completely unnatural, the, the left leg had to be made longer. It had to be extended uh, because the body is not leaning forward. The hips aren't thrusting forward because that would add sort of too much movement, too much livelihood, and that's what not Egyptian sculpture. That's what not Egyptian sculpture is, and about that, Egyptian sculpture is about preserving permanence, and so you don't want this kind of body flailing forward. So we have this very formal left foot out. I call it the Egyptian hokey pokey. But you had to make the leg longer to make that work. Uh, also, look at the 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 bilateral symmetry. Egyptian sculpture is divided almost equally in half. Once again, again, given this sort of feeling of kind of permanence of things that are unchanging, this idea of perfection also. So we have this sort of lack of emotion. We have this sort of youthful face. We have these strong bodies. We have this sort of perfectly balanced body. And we have this left foot thrusting forward. Now, what's fascinating to me about Egyptian sculpture, and the image on the right you're going to see another video that goes into even more detail, but is once we move out of the pharaoh, images of the pharaoh, and we start looking at images of lower classes, and in this case, not much lower. We're looking at a scribe. And so this would have been a person belonging to the priest class. Both of these images would have been people belonging to the priest class. These are people who were incredibly powerful, incredibly learned. But they're not the pharaoh. And if we look at these images of these two scribes, we can see something very remarkable and very different. Their bodies are a lot more naturalistic. 
the image on the right especially, this scribe has sort of a typical middle-aged body. He has sort of a little bit of a belly, he has love and handles, he has sort of man boobs. <laughs> uh, and we are getting a much more lifelike, realistic, and naturalistic uh, appearance in this sculpture, which um, and the lower you go, sort of on the the the, the ranking of Egyptian hierarchy, uh, social hierarchy, the more naturalistic the image will be. And so, yet here's another example of another uh, scribe. And in both of these images, the image here of uh, Himenu and the scribe here, you see them actually doing their job uh, of writing sacred text. Um, this is, you know, not only, un this is not uncommon, not just for priests, but for really any class of people. Uh, in the afterlife, you often see them doing the things that they did in this life, because that would mean that you would continue that role of whatever it was you were in the next life. But so here we see, once again, this very naturalistic body, this belly, uh, this sort of middle-aged flab uh, that we would never, ever see on a pharaoh. However, the statue is still rigid, it is still strong, it still conveys a sense of power and permanence and perfection. And we can't, of course, really talk about Egyptian art without talking about the... Um, use of, of murals um, um, within Egyptian tombs. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is an image of um, an Egyptian governor uh, named T. Uh, this is a image of a, of a hippopotamus hunt. So when, um, when the Egyptians are buried, um, there is this concept that you, you know, death is a journey and you must prepare for it, you must pack for it, and you literally, you know, the old saying is you can't take it with you, well, the, the Egyptians would have argued against that vehemently. They believed you must take it with you because you needed, uh, like on any trip, you need things to do, you need stuff to sustain you, and this isn't only going to become a uh, be evident in the use of grave goods, but also in the use of the imagery on the walls of tombs. So here we see T, uh, this governor, and you can tell he's the big guy in charge because of the use of hieratic scale. He is larger than everybody else. He is standing in this sort of typical Egyptian um, composite figure with his head in profile. Uh, with his eye on the side of his head, his torso is shown facing us, and his feet are shown in profile. Once again, the, the composite figure means that we are seeing the body composited from uh, d d parts seen at different angles, because this is, uh, once again, what we would call a conceptual image. This is how we conceive of the human body, when you conceive of uh, a person, you often think of looking at them from the front, so we see a forward torso, but when you think of legs, you often picture them in motion, in profile from the side. Same way with the head, which we see in profile, but the eye stares straight at us because that's what eyes look like. Eyes stare at us. They don't stare away from us. So we see this composite figure. Um, notice, though, um, how stiff he appears compared to the, um, the hunters next to him, how much more naturalistic, how much more lifelike. This is, um, and we will see this strategy play out, this visual strategy play out throughout Egyptian art. The sort of lower classes, the less important people, as you guys know by now after looking at the statues, tend to be more realistic, whereas the more rarefied, the, um, the more elite classes tend to be more abstract and iconic. They tend to be less realistic and, because they are more untouchable. They are less human in a way. They are more, the, the, it's, it's more important to use symbols uh, of, of their personhood as opposed to try to capture a more realistic kind of portrait of them. Uh, we see uh, T sort of presiding over this hunt. Um, 
Notice the um, kind of plethora, uh, if you will, of fishes in, this, in the river below him, and then all of these great birds and foxes and monkeys and all sorts of things in the trees above. And this very low relief sculpture. Um, the, you know, the idea is that in the afterlife, not only do you take things with you, but you also um, include on the walls of the tomb things you like to do. And hunting, um, especially of the upper classes, was a very favorite pastime, so we often see images of hunting included in the tombs of elite Egyptians. Um, but also, this, this river is not just a place to hunt. There's a sort of symbolic reference to the journey into the afterlife here, these, as these boats move from one shore to another, as the soul uh, transports um, itself from one plane, one existence of the living to the realm of the dead. Uh, if we look at another image from the murals of T's tomb, um, we can you can see that that realism play out even more so here uh, in this rather kind of fun image, especially at the the lower um, lower image we see uh, a, a herder with some cows, and I, I, you know when you compare sort of the stiffness of Egyptian figures, uh, just like we we saw in um, Assyrian art, look how much more lifelike the animals are, especially in their movement. Um, the, 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 the artist is given a lot more freedom um, with these animals to express emotion and to sort of make them more realistic in terms of their behavior uh, than with the humans, especially with elite humans. And then if we look at this figure over here, um, sort of hunched over, uh, we can see this um, on his back. He has, I believe, a goat uh, who is sort of looking backwards in this really kind of fun way at the cows who are looking up at him. It's a rather kind of funny, funny image, I think, uh, once you start really looking closely. And I think, I think belies a, um, a sense of humor that we don't usually associate with Egyptian art. But occasionally in these little nooks and crannies in the corners of these pictures that, you know, are often very, very reverent, because Egyptian art is very reverent, it's very serious, it's, it's religious art, uh, and it has a, a sort of weight to it, a gravitas, a seriousness to it. Uh, but if you look closely enough here and there, you can find little bits of fun, little bits of silliness, little bits of humor, um, like goats um, sort of teasing cows. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in, in the corner of this little image, in, uh, in what is otherwise um, uh, a rather sort of seri self-serious kind of image. Um, uh, also, I want you to remind you once again, these would not have been, these are images not intended for living eyes, but these are images intended for the eyes of the dead. And that's something we always have to remember when we look at so much Egyptian art, especially the art of tombs. This is, these were made for the dead.